I came to the University of Southampton four years after the medical school began. Uh, it was uh, 1975 when I arrived. So I'm just going to give a few minutes to try and sort of give you an idea about where we feel medicine's going in this area. Um, and of course, we're on the edge of a a bit of a biological and medical revolution at the moment, which is very exciting indeed. And I'm going to try and give you um, some idea about what this means and what it means for the disease that I've spent my life working with and a number of people in this room have been involved as well. So I'm going to start off with a historical picture. This is William Osler, who of course um, founded the Johns Hopkins Medical School and then came and became the Regis Professor of Medicine in Oxford when he was 59 years old. And he wrote an incredible textbook called The Principles and Practice of Medicine first published in 1892. And he really was one of the most amazing men because what he did is take um, pathology, which in those days was just really uh, awakening because the Germans had just discovered dye stuffs that could stain cells. So he took pathology and then integrated it into, into clinical observation and physiology and really was able to advance disease hugely. And if one reads his chapter on asthma, it's quite interesting. He catalogues very nicely uh, the events that occur in this disease, with narrowing of the airways, etc., etc. But then at the end of it, he calls it all a nervous disease, which kind of let it down a little bit. But anyway, he, he was a great man. And m much of our practice of medicine today was based on that Oslerian uh, uh, idea. But things are beginning to get difficult now, because discovering the causes of human disease, which obviously the last century has been quite successful in, uh, leading to drug development, etc., uh, is no longer really delivering the knowledge that we need to develop new treatments. And I've listed on this slide a few reasons for that, and I needn't really read them out to you. But I think one of the things uh, that's important here is that the whole disease spectrum is moving much more towards chronic non-communicable disease and as the populations age like here in the UK we're getting increases in these diseases that you know a hundred years ago really we're not seeing that often because people died so much younger. You know now we've got problems with diet and obesity and drugs and all the rest of it, air pollution and so on. So there are pressures that are creating uh, I think uh, diseases now that are becoming very difficult to manage. And then on the other side of the equation, as many of you all know, the, the pharmaceutical industry is also not doing that well uh, for all sorts of reasons. Basically, they're shrinking in number and the number of new drugs that are coming forward, although they're beginning to take off again now, and I'll explain that in a, a little later on, have really gone through the doldrums somewhat. And the reason for that uh, is because to develop a drug costs huge amounts of money. And here we, we, it costs about a billion dollars to get one drug into the clinic. And you can see over the time course of, what, six to eight years, how long it takes to get something through all the, the clinical testing out the other end. But the wastage, if you look on the left-hand side, up to 10,000 chemical entities will be started with. And of course, ending up with one drug at the end of the day. I mean, this isn't a, a business model you would want to build the future on. And something's going to have to happen. And the industry is responding to this in a very positive way at the moment. And it's very exciting. And again, we might want to discuss uh, that in a few moments. With those two uh, rather difficult situations, we have an amazing thing happening out there in science. And the universities across the world are contributing enormously to this. And this is the explosion of being able to interrogate complexity which started off in physics and, and in engineering, uh, mathematics, but now at last is coming into biology and into medicine. The um, digitization of biology, really, which is the revolution we're about to uh, witness. And the technologies that are going with that are able to take systems right the way down to cells, up to populations, and analyze them as complex systems, just as our astronomers are doing at the moment when they're finding all these new galaxies all over the place. So this is the tremendous excitement that's driving our universities in medicine uh, at the moment, and Southampton, I'm pleased to say, is right up there in all of this. And the technologies, really, relate to uh, being able to use um, uh, comp uh, computer-driven um, learning to 
pick away at the complexity within cell systems, within organs, and within populations. The so-called omics, as it's sometimes referred to, genomics, genes, proteomics, proteins, metabolomics, the things we excrete in urine or circulate in our blood. And the technology, of course, within each one of these is getting more complex as well. So they're learning not only how to analyze the human genome, but obviously how to analyze the, how the genome is controlled and the bits of the genome that control itself and how it operates. So all of these different uh, mechanisms now uh, are in place and enable us to be able to challenge what we're doing. Uh, guidelines are very important and the guidelines for treating asthma were one of the first set of important guidelines that got into the uh, publications and this is I think one of the latest versions of that from the Global Initiative for Asthma. Uh, but the difficulty with all of this is that there are patients who kind of don't fit into this, okay? So this treats everybody as if they're a homogeneous population. In other words, one sort of set of drugs or treatments does not suit everybody. And this is where this new omics is beginning to come in, because it respects a basic principle which may be, when we look at population sciences, we sometimes overlook. And that is, in the days when um, I was taught medicine, um, you would learn from your teachers, uh, you would pass on that knowledge uh, to your patient in the form of treatments. But of course, what's happened now is that patients often come to our clinics knowing much more about the disease than the doctor does. And there you've got a quite interesting conversation that sometimes takes place. In other words, patients are taking ownership of their own illness, which is terrific, but of course is very challenging for us as medical professionals because we need to try and make best use of that. And sometimes it can catch you out on the left foot if they know an awful lot more about the disease than you do. So pulling all this together, the politicians often say, putting the patient at the center of health care. Well, of course, that's a political statement. But now, with this new biology, we really can do personalized medicine. We can treat each human being as an individual and understand the biology in, of their particular disease. And this has been called all sorts of names. In the United States, they often use the term P4 medicine. Uh, here we use the term stratified medicine. Uh, but there are different terms. But it doesn't matter. It's basically saying the same thing. You take a complex disease like asthma, and you can salami slice it into very different mechanistic pathways, such that the treatment that you give those individuals will be targeted to their particular pathways. I kind of thought, well, maybe I could do something for the country where my roots are. So one of the things that I did was uh, I said, uh, why don't I get uh, these people to reconnect with the world? So we founded an association, British Medical Association, British Yugoslav Medical Association. And, and the first thing that I thought was, well, I want, we, we need to give these people a little bit like your New England uh, founder, um, give, them, give them the knowledge, reconnect them with the world. So advancing asthma through uh, collaboration. Uh, the reason why I chose this was, uh, I think, partly because I think that's the only way to advance. And the other that, as Steve, Steve said uh, in his opening remarks, is that we're pretty good at collaboration. I, I go back to the late uh, 80s when you started building your team. In fact, you were bringing in collaborators. And when these people went back to their respective countries, uh, they continue to collaborate with us, and they still they still do. Uh, so uh, it, it is a little bit audacious for me to say that it's the Southampton way, but it it is something that we're very fond of, and we invest into, and we invest that into that strategically by getting the engineers and you know the, all the life sciences people, the, the mathematicians, uh, to work together. And, and our VC is very supportive of that. Our associate dean for research is extremely supportive of that. So, so we are we we, we do like to uh, collaborate. Now, uh, we uh, of course the the activity uh, that we uh, uh, are, are focused on uh, within the biomedical uh, research unit uh, is is of course on on respiratory medicine. And as uh, those of you who know and have followed. Uh, uh, our publications, our work, know that we, we do believe uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the life course and some of the 
uh, major discoveries of the role of epigenetics, the conditioning in utero, uh, uh, have been derived uh, from Southampton. But the, the, the thing that I think uh, transformed and has the potential to really uh, make a big uh, advance is, is collaboration, uh, not just within the UK, but collaboration across uh, uh, the, uh, the continent of Europe, and uh, indeed uh, with uh, colleagues uh, across uh, the pond. So uh, in uh, uh, 2009, uh, Peter Sturck and I, over a glass of beer, conceived this uh, program called uh, You My Friend, pulled in Fan Chung and Ian Adcock, and then uh, approached various people. Jorgen Vespa was approached, and, and then the enthusiasm that uh, this received uh, was, was really enormous because people felt that we were at a stage where in order to translate all the scientific knowledge that had been accumulated, all the, all the steps, all the uh, uh, fine tools, the scientific tools, we really couldn't do it alone. We were past the stage of the Cox, the Jenners, where they could do it by themselves in their lab, in a small experiment, indeed experimenting often on themselves. Now you need it to get together with people because we individually did not possess uh, all the all the knowledge that was uh, that was required, and also uh, we didn't have enough uh, patience uh, to to, uh, to uh, address uh, some of these uh, big questions. And out of that program, which uh, uh, which uh, finished uh, um, uh, last year, uh, we uh, then developed some internal uh, UK uh, programs. So. This was funded by the Medical Research Council, and we owe uh, to Steve uh, and, and Des, uh, where is Des? Uh, uh, they, they kind of uh, uh, created a, a, an opportunity for us to, uh, to apply as a consortium of United Kingdom uh, uh, universities to uh, study uh, the phenomenon of refractory uh, asthma stratification. So we established a program that uh, has some very focused uh, biomarkers, but is also using the U bi 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 biomarkers to uh, try to uh, make practical, good use uh, of uh, all that wonderful knowledge that we had acquired uh, in, in U biopred. And then taking that further from, uh, from uh, U biopred, we had identified a plethora of biomarkers, and we, it's, it's going to take us a number of years to fully appreciate exactly what they uh, what they mean, but we thought well, the best way to uh, see what they can do for us in, in practical terms is to uh, to test them and to test them with with a drug. So we could have done it with with steroids, and we, we, indeed we uh, we did fail with one one application. We wanted to see if you gave uh, depomedrol, what would happen to these biomarkers, but. The second uh, 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 thing that we uh, we managed to persuade was uh, was Novartis, who have this uh, uh, very effective uh, anti-Ig uh, antibody, which is reserved uh, for severe patients because it's an expensive drug. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we we didn't know how the how, how exactly how the drug works. We had some idea, so uh, we're in the process of uh, uh, conducting that study. It's a it's a bold. Four million pound investment uh, from Novartis, so I think quite a uh, quite a, a a brave uh, move on the part of the company. And uh, where, as we speak, we're putting together now a uh, that would be the grandchild of of of, of you by Fred, uh, which is this uh, uh, beat severe asthma beyond allergic tea to difficult asthma. This is what uh, Jeff uh, I was alluding to when I said we have these uh, wonderful, uh, I, I, I really mean it, excellent uh, biologics, and we now need to understand how do we, how do we select the right patient uh, for those, uh, those drugs, because they are expensive and, and we want to choose the, the very best. Now, uh, this is universities collaborating, uh, PIs collaborating, but I think society has, has a role uh, uh, to play in this. And so uh, a thing called the Translational uh, Research uh, Partnership uh, was, was created. And uh, we all jumped on the opportunity. We had to compete enormously. 
and not get any money for it. It wasn't it wasn't a, a, a heavily funded uh, program, but still there was that societal uh, element. In other words, we, we we knew that we had the government with us. The government of the day was uh, uh, was uh, was Labour, and then uh, the Conservatives uh, who took over were equally supportive, and 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 everybody, literally everybody, is uh, hugely supportive. So this this interaction, this this collaboration, is I think uh, the transformation that uh, has already uh, been achieved. So, if I look at the history, we had uh, the individual working in their lab, looking at the bacillus, looking at microscopes, and uh, and, and and that was the discovery. The discovery, the fine science, was being developed. The second phase, I think, in the in this journey of beating disease is collaboration and I'll tell you at the end of my talk what I think the next phase should be. So the uh, inflammatory respiratory diseases uh, uh, TRP there are two there's one in uh, rheumatological diseases and we work uh, with them on overlapping uh, d diseases but you can see here if you if you bother to look at uh, at the individuals who uh, run uh, the uh, their uh, their centers, and and and, and our focus. It, it really is a a wonderful uh, wonderful partnership. Industry has responded to this because we uh, we extended our hand to industry to come with uh, with projects which we thought we could deliver to them better than anybody else. And I say that without any hesitation, because we got some of the best scientists in the United Kingdom. And because we've got the support of, uh, of the uh, uh, National Institute for Health Research, their, their office is really uh, hugely, uh, hugely supportive. And you can see here some of the studies which are at various uh, stages uh, of development. Uh, to date, we have uh, a program of 25 million uh, pounds. And that is uh, over a period of uh, six, seven years. So it's quite an impressive um, uh, outcome. And, and really, purely due to uh, the acceptance that collaboration is is the next quantum leap that we have to, uh, to achieve. Uh, but then, uh, this is the third element. This is the third step in, in that journey. And that is getting the patients and the public to be at the center of all this. I don't say that opportunistically, but I say that because that's the way it's got to be. If you think at provider-customer relations in any field of work, it's the customer who is in charge. And we have an anomaly that in medicine, yes, the patient, we all say that it's all about the patient, but who decides? Who decides what programs we do? It's, forgive me, the MRC, NIHR, NIH, governments, ministers. But what we try to do in the UK, and Asthma UK has been fantastic in this, is, is to, to create what we call uh, the, the, the public patient involvement, which is really, really delivering fantastically. The atmosphere changes when you have a bunch of scientists, a bunch of doctors. The atmosphere changes when you have patients with us. The, 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 the sense of responsibility, uh, the sense of... Uh, the sense of awareness of what the real issues are is is, is markedly different, and and I think you know uh, the UK uh, really uh, leads in, in in that respect. And in Southampton, uh, we're fortunate we've got the the national organisation called Involve, which is which is placed there, and so we have learned uh, a, a lot from them. So really, I I I I, I just wanted to. Um, share with you my thoughts about these three elements. We heard very nicely about the development of, of, of all the sort of uh, medical knowledge and, uh, and I've given you uh, some insight into, into the networks that we have, we've created, including you know, our collaborations with, with SARP, which have been excellent. But uh, I just want to uh, uh, put this slide up, uh, and I'm not going to expand on any of them, just uh, to make you think about what uh, the, the current issues, uh, I think, ahead of us are. So, um, funding is is obviously an, an issue. We have medicine is expensive. Uh, the the new drugs that we're developing are expensive. Uh, the the ways that we conduct research, you know, the Ubiprid costs twenty two million. 
So we, we couldn't do that. A single drug company could not support that. The MRC couldn't support that. So, so that's, that's an issue. Then there's the issue of competition. We compete. So uh, pharma competes, rightly so. They're industry. They're business-minded. I think we, we, we need to get the balance right between competition and, uh, uh, and, and a sense of shared purpose where it doesn't matter, where what matters is the ultimate result and not where I am on, on that particular uh, paper. Uh, of course, there's, there's the big issue of prior, prioritization. You know, how, how do we, we have limited resources, how do we do it, what, what do we invest into? And finally, I, I think patient engagement, and, and probably engagement is, is not a strong enough word, I would say patient ownership.